And now in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Well, good morning, Cathedral. <laughs> What a joy and a privilege and a blessing to be able to be back with you. And I just thank um, your bishop and dean, Bishop Buddy and uh, Dean Hollerith and all the clergy and the people of this cathedral for extending this invitation to um, return and be with you during this season of Advent. This is for me in many respects, um, a kind of homecoming um, at the nine o'clock service, I was able to sit in the seat of the presiding bishop. I haven't sat there since I was installed as presiding bishop three years ago, and it was just good to sit there again. It's not the most comfortable seat in the world, but it's, it's nice. <laughs> but even more than that, it is just such a joy to be in this wonderful cathedral. And, and in a very real sense, a homecoming for me. And I'll tell you why in a moment. Matthew's Gospel from the 11th chapter. John the Baptist is in prison. He has been arrested by King Herod, who is a vassal and a puppet of the Roman Empire. Israel-Palestine at that time, as you know, was a colonized nation like much of the known Western world. John the Baptist was in prison. He would eventually be executed, beheaded to be more specific. As he languished in prison, some of his disciples were able to visit him and he said to them, go and find Jesus of Nazareth. I've been hearing things. Go and carry this message to Jesus. Are you he who is to come or shall we look for another? Are you the one are the hopes and fears of all the years met in you? Dare we, can we, may we, may we hope? May we hope that the yoke of oppression that is upon us will be loosed and will be set free? May we hope that the poorest among us may know the joy and abundance that God intends for all. Dare we hope that this world will be a world where somehow we learn how to lay down our swords and shields down by the riverside, the study war no more. Dare we hope? that every man, woman, child, that everyone will be treated as a child of God, made in the image of God. Are you the one who is to come? Or do we have to look for another one? That's, that's what's going on there. And I didn't really realize the power of this until I thought about what I've been doing for the last couple of months. Now, if you're like my daughters, my two daughters, they ask me regularly, they say, we knew what you used to do as a parish priest. And we kind of knew what you did when you were Bishop of North Carolina. You went around and confirmed people, so we kind of knew that. We have absolutely no idea what do you do as presiding bishop? I just tell them I get on airplanes. That's what I do. But in the last two months, I've been on airplanes, which is not unusual. But in the course of the last two months, I've been at several cathedrals, several Anglican cathedrals, and been able to preach and speak 
and meet dear and wonderful brothers, sisters, and siblings of our Anglican communion. I've traveled and I was in Canterbury Cathedral with the dean in this Canterbury pulpit. It reminds me of, of him, Dean Willis, a dear and wonderful man. I was there at Canterbury Cathedral and was able to speak and to be with the people of God. And later I was at St. Paul's Cathedral in London and there to be, to see that cathedral full and to be able to be with God's people there. Later on, I was, was in Sri Lanka right before Thanksgiving and was in the cathedral in the capital city there. And I went from there just a few days before Thanksgiving from Sri Lanka to Hong Kong to be with my dear friend Archbishop Paul Kwong and the dean of the cathedral there as they commemorated their 170th anniversary of Anglican Christianity there. And now today I'm here, home. There's no place like home. But I noticed something. There's a common thread and pattern running through each one. And it makes sense of John the Baptist. There in Sri Lanka, where they, we were there when they had just had an election and there was tension in the air. A nation that not long ago had lived through a civil war, ethnic and religious civil war, and still was trying to figure out, is it possible? Is e pluribus unum possible in any nation? Is it possible from the wondrous tapestry and diversity and the variety that God has put in this world? Is it possible that we can actually learn to live together? And they were asking and not sure, are you he is the one? Or do we have to wait for somebody else? Went from there to, to, to Hong Kong. And I need not tell you with the people of Hong Kong where they are even at this moment as we speak, are you the he who is to come? Or do we have to wait for another? And with our friends in Great Britain, even in this time and in this moment, are you he who is to come? Or do we have to wait for another? And now I'm here in the capital of this great country. And even here in this moment, even here in this moment of our history, we are not sure, can we hope again? Can government work? Can the economy work? Will our children have an earth where they can breathe the air and drink the water and live on land? We're not sure. John asked our question, are you he who is to come? Or do we have to wait? God. Where are you? We need you. But I want you to notice something. John sent those words to Jesus. And when Jesus heard them, he answered, and it sounds, actually, he sounds a little bit like, a, like he's a politician. It really is evasive. I mean, John asked, it was kind of a yes or no question. Are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? Yes or no, right? But no, that's not what Jesus does. Jesus answers back in what seems like an evasion, but, but I've realized there's the message. He answers John in, in what I would call kind of poetic code, if you will. Remember, John was the leader of an underground spiritual movement about changing life and the world. That's what repentance really means. It means to turn in a new direction. It means to change. It means to find a new moral compass, a new spiritual center of gravity that directs and guides your life. That's what repentance really means. John was about repentance, and he got in trouble when he got specific about what that actually meant. That's why he lost his head. 
it's better to stay in generalities than... <laughs> And so, remember, this is an underground movement, and even the Jesus movement was really an underground movement. I mean, if you want to know what early Christianity was like, think about Harriet Tubman. Christianity was an underground railroad for folk that set the captive free. So they didn't talk in explicit language. Of course they talk in coded language. And Jesus responds to, are y'all with me? I want to make sure we're together. Yeah, Jesus responds to John in prophetic code. He goes back to Isaiah 35 in Isaiah 61, and he tells his disciples, go and tell John what it says in Isaiah 35. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the poor have good news preached to them. Go and tell John what Isaiah said in Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty all those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the great getting up morning. Well, my grandma said it that way, but that's what Jesus meant. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Wherever freedom breaks out, however tentative, Wherever, as Ubi Caritas, that medieval hymn, says, wherever true love is found, God himself is there. You tell John that. You tell John, behold, your God. Or as that old hymn says, God moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and then rides upon the storm. God is not finished with this world and be below the veil of sight. God is still here. And the truth is, well, let me say it this way, and, I'll, and I will sit down. <laughs> the, the, the truth is, faith is about trusting that God knows what God is doing. That's why you need to come to church, because this, this world sends the opposite message. And you need to go somewhere where you get reminded, God knows what God is doing, and God is still on the throne, as the old folk used to say. Some years ago, a number of years ago now, our youngest daughter, who's now 25 or 26, was three. And I was rector of St. James Church in, in Baltimore, Maryland, and um, had wonderful years there. And my wife was teaching school, and so she would leave earlier than I had to leave, because clergy don't really work, except one day a week anyway. But anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> and so she would leave earlier. And our older daughter would go with her, and Elizabeth would go with me, because she was, actually went to a daycare not far from St. James. And so um, this one particular morning, I had you know, looked in the paper and, and had watched on television and had, had seen that the weather forecast said that it was going to rain. And so I told Elizabeth, I said, Elizabeth, um, go get, you know, she was ready to get her little lunchbox and everything. And I said, Elizabeth, go, go get your raincoat, because it's, it's going to rain later on. And she said, well, it's not raining right now. I said, no, honey, I know it's not raining right now, but it's, it's it, remember, she's three now. It's not raining right now, but it, it's going to rain, um, you know, later on. And she said, well, Mommy didn't say it was going to rain. <laughs> and I pulled up my pants and said, I wear the pants in the family. It doesn't mean anything, but I wear them. Um, I said, well, I, I know Mommy didn't say that, but um, I know. And then I realized, I said, okay, this is an educational moment. And let me just take advantage of it. And I said, oh, honey, I know. It doesn't, it's not raining right now. And she actually ran to the living room and pulled back the curtain and said, look, it's not raining outside. The sun was actually shining. And I said, honey, I know it's not raining right now, but it's gonna rain. And, and again, I got into a good parent mode. And I said, let me, let me instruct her on how I know this. I, my epistemology, as the philosophers call it. My source, how I know what I know. And so I said, well, Elizabeth, um, see, I, I read in the paper and I read the weather forecast there. 
and I watched the Today Show, and Mr. Al Roker said it was going to rain. <laughs> and I figured if Al Roker said it was going to rain, it's going to rain. Anyway, she still didn't believe it, and, and after a while, I got to that point that every parent has gotten to. You know, you get to the point where you've just about had enough, and I finally said, Elizabeth, just go put your raincoat on. <laughs> so she did. She put a little raincoat on, and she came back out, and we got in the car, and she was kind of pouting because she, anyway, she's a strong-willed child. Anyway, she was not happy that I had overruled her anyway, so we got in the car, and we drove, you know, um, downtown, and um, you know, I, I took her inside the uh, preschool. Now, we're in preschool. This is pre-kindergarten. I took her inside and, um, you know, took her to the teacher, and she took off her little raincoat and went on and gave her my little kiss. And then I went back, and I sat down in the car, and I said, you know something, that little three-year-old something, she thought she knew more than me. I have breathed more in one day than she's been breathing her whole life. I said, she actually, and really, from her perspective, she figured she knew more than her father. Now, here I was, maybe 40 years old at the time. I mean, here I was. I said, I'm your father. I went to college more years than you've been on this earth. And then on top of it, went to seminary too. And the Episcopal Church said, I knew something. And you actually, she actually, and then I said, child, don't you know I'm the rector of St. James Church? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know who your father is? No, that didn't matter. From her angle of vision, I didn't know as much as she did. And I, I finally sat there and I actually had to laugh because I said, you know something? That must be what we look like to God. God must look back at us and put God's hands on God's cosmic hips and say, they are so cute. <laughs> they actually think they know something. They've been around four score year and 10 and they think they know something. Don't they know that I was there when the world came into being from the fabric of nothing ex nihilo? Don't they know that before there was anything, I decreed, let there be light and there was something? Where were they? Don't they know that I was the one that summoned up old Moses and told Moses, go down Moses, way down in Egypt land, and you just tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Don't they know that I was the one that gave Esther courage to stand up in the day of tyranny? Don't they know that I sent prophets when they needed prophets? Don't they know that I was the one that told Mary, Mary, you're going to have a baby? And Mary said, wait a minute, I don't have a husband. But he said, don't worry about it. This is the first century, not the 21st century. <laughs> And he said, you have a baby, and Mary had a baby, as the old slaves used to say. Don't they know that this Jesus faced the powers of this world and was crushed and executed by the power of the Roman Empire? But on the third day, on the third day when nobody was around, on that third day when everybody was asleep, I caused the earth to quake. I forced a stone before a tomb to roll away. And I gave Jesus life from the dead. Don't they know that I'm their God and that I am the God who is love? Don't they know? what their own Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 10, beloved, let us love one another because love is of God and those who love are born of God and know God because God is love. Don't they know that love is the most powerful force in all of the cosmos because the source of all true love is God? Don't they know? that I love them and that love in the end will be the last word. Don't they know that in spite of appearances, I'm still on the throne and I've got them in my hands. He's got the whole world in his hands 
He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. God love you. God bless you. And may God hold us all in those almighty hands of love.